Shabbat Shalom. So, uh, by the way, next week is Hanukkah. Hanukkah, we're going to light up for Hanukkah. And uh, we're going to talk also about the relationship between Hanukkah and uh, Christmas. In fact, there's a strong relationship between these two feasts. And also, uh, at Christmas, after that Christmas service, we're going to have a special service. Uh, each elders will come up and they will tell you how they grew during the, the past year, what the Lord has done in their lives. And uh, next year, by the way, uh, we're going to have a baptism. Anybody here hasn't been baptized and needs to be baptized, come and see. You know, baptism is important. It is an identification. This is at a time where you identify with the Lord and uh, in front of men, in front of God, in front of the angels as well. So let's open up our scriptures to Luke chapter 2. You know, I would like to begin today with a verse that we find in the book of Malachi. It is a relevant verse. It is in this section of Malachi that is right between the prophecy of John the Baptist in chapter 3 and the prophecy of Elijah in chapter 4, a section that is representative of the time of the gospel we are covering and of the time we are living today as well. You know, historically, the Israelites were under fierce opposition to build the house of God. And many of them had lost their zeal and faith. They were very discouraged. And they could not anymore see the advantage of serving God. But not all of them did lose their faith. There was still a small remnant, a small group of people who gathered and prayed together. And it is to them that God turns. And see what it says in Malachi 3.16. You have it in the screen. It says, And those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. I want to tell you this is one of the most beautiful passages in the scriptures as it speaks of the communion between believers and between the believers and God himself. How he listens to them. How he marks down all their good deeds. All that they do for him. Because he wants to reward them. Right? These believers stood out in the crowd. Because they feared the Lord, it says. And they meditated on the Lord. That is, they studied God. They loved him so much that they thought about him day after day. And this reminds us of Joseph and Mary. Of Elizabeth and Zachariah. Of the shepherds. And of Simeon and of Anna. These were the ones ushering this time between John the Baptist and Elijah. These were of the remnants. And we have seen how Mary and Elizabeth rejoiced so much when they met together. And how Zachariah and later Simeon spoke so highly of the Lord. And this widow, Anna, one of the first evangelists, it seems that no one could stop her proclaiming the truth. These are among those who are written in the book of remembrance. But there were not many of them to usher the incarnation of the word of God because these were to be as their Messiah, that is, they were to be despised. Taking a close look at them, some of them belonged to two groups, to one of two groups, rejected by the religious leaders. You had the shepherds and you had the women. We have seen how these leaders, despite the shepherds and especially the priestly shepherds, we've seen this last week, to whom the angel of the Lord came to announce the coming of the Messiah, where were they despised? We're not told. There was no apparent reason, but it is because of their involvement with the Messiah. And there we find three women, Mary, Elizabeth, and Anna. While their testimony, while the testimony of women was not accepted at the time, God used three of them, three giants of the faith. No religious leader could match even in their meticulous attempt to follow the law. They could not match their faith. And few could match the humility of Joseph and the faith of Zachariah. And later in the text, we will meet this man, Shimeon, for whom history indicate to us that he was in a high position but so despised, we will learn that his name, it seems, was erased from all the religious writings of the time because of his faith in Yeshua. But does it really matter? Does it really matter that his name was erased from their book? What is most important? 
is to have your name mentioned in the book of God, the book of remembrance. This is what really comes out of the first passages of the book of Luke. Before the account, by the way, of the ministry of the Messiah, we see here the persistent and unrelenting faith of those that are his. And what does the Lord say of, of them? Look at the next verse in Malachi. They shall be mine, says the Lord. They shall be mine, says Jehovah of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son, who serves them, right? That these words are right in between the two prophecies of John the Baptist and Elijah, you cannot but pour them at the feet of these great believers mentioned in the first chapters of Luke. But I want to tell you something, that God has his book of remembrance still open. It is not closed. And there is not one iota or deeds or words or thoughts that you offer to him that he will overlook. He wants to reward us. So the world may be against all those who follow him, but he is there watching and recording all that he sees. Now let's go back to the announcement of the coming of the word of God to the shepherds. Let's read again verses 8 to 14 of chapter 2 of Luke. There are many things in there for us today. It says, Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel of the Lord said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to our men. You know, the shepherd were keeping watch over the flock. An angel of the Lord was sent to announce the coming of the Messiah. The original text says an angel, not the angel, as some translations have it. There is no definite article. Putting it in there may bring the reader to confusion because the angel of the Lord is who? Amen. It is the Messiah himself in the Old Testament. Again, I want to tell you the term angel does not speak of the nature of the person. This name primarily designates one who carries an important message and who is called to perform a specific commission. And that of the Messiah was the message of salvation and the work of redemption. And here, this is announced by an angel of the Lord. And the text tells us that when the announcement was given, the glory of the Lord shone around them. This is the appearance of the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, who returned after an absence of hundreds of years. The last we have seen it is the temple, when it left the temple in Ezekiel 434. It says, And the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. Right? And now it comes back from the east as well. As we see in Matthew 2, 2, for we have seen his stars, the Magi says, in the east, and have come to worship him. You know, the rabbis have coined this divine glory by the name of Shekinah glory. They needed a term to explain the many physical appearances of God in the Old Testament. You know, this word comes from the word Mishkan, which means the tabernacle, which means the temple. But now the glory of the Lord was coming to dwell, not in the temple of Jerusalem, but in the body of the baby Yeshua. Remember also that when John said that Jesus came to dwell with us, he used the same, the, the Greek word that is meaning skinny, which is a word that is borrowed from the Hebrew, from the word Mishkan or Shekinah. So in Yeshua then we have the full revelation of God. Full as far as we can see only, of course. And he is, like in Hebrews 1, 3 says, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Express image. He is God incarnate, as we're going to see further in the text. And see how the Messiah is called in verse 11. 
It says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. Did you know that this name Savior is only given to God, to Jehovah in the Old Testament? And here it is given to Jesus. Again, we can see the deity of the Messiah. We can see that it is God himself who incarnated himself into the body of the Messiah. Remember these verses, like in Isaiah 43, 11. It says, I, even I, Jehovah. And besides me, there's no Savior. And in the New Testament, Jesus says that he's the Savior. Who then is Jesus for you? He is either God or he is nothing. There's no middle point. And this title, God guards very jealously. As he says in Isaiah 45, 21. He says, is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. And here it is, Jesus that is speaking. And the wonderful news of the angel is that, For there is born unto you this day the city of David, the Savior, the Savior of the Old Testament, this title Lord, that refers to us the supreme, actually power, the supreme person of God. And to the shepherds was given a sign, a very relevant one, a sign that is for us as well. See again verse 12. It says, and this will be the sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. What is the sign here? You know, there are two things that the angel mentions. But the two things are just one sign. How then these two things, the swaddling clothes and the manger, represent together what sign? First, we notice that in the original text, the word sign has a definite article. It is not a sign, but it is the sign. Again, different translation would give, would choose one or the other. In the Greek, there is no indefinite article, such as a house or a man or such things, but when there is no article, it is assumed indefinite. But when the Greek uses a definite article, it is because it wants to stress something important. It calls us to pay close attention, according to Greek lexicons. When the definite article is used, it, the emphasis is upon the, the particular uniqueness, and the context may refer back or resume an initial use of the sign. Mm. So by saying the sign, we may assume an antecedent of the sign. Can you think of a sign that was previously given in relation to the birth of the Messiah? Yes? Isaiah 7.14. He says, therefore the Lord himself will give you what? A sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the sign that came to completion, the birth of the Messiah through a virgin. The Septuagint used the same Greek word for Luke 1, 12 and Isaiah 7, 14. But how would the shepherd understand all of this? Notice what it says in Luke 2, 12. This will be a sign and to you. This will be a sign to you, as if the message, the sign is here adapted to them. And it is. What then is the sign to the shepherds? How can we understand the sign that is given to them? If we read, by the way, verses 11, 13, and 14, skipping verse 12, we can perhaps understand the power of the sign that is given in verse 12. Let's do that now. I'm going to read verse 11, 13, and 14. Skip verse 12 for now. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, God, good will toward men. This sounds like the Messiah was coming on earth on a white horse to establish his kingdom of peace. Here it speaks of peace on earth, something we do not have yet. And the multitude of angels came to earth to praise him. It sounds like Revelation 19, just before the Lord comes, when they all said hallelujah the first time that the word hallelujah is mentioned in the New Testament. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. But the interruption of verse 12 indicate to us and to the shepherds that Jesus will first come in a humble state. That, I believe, is the sign. 
Verse 12 divides the time of his two comings and speaks of his first coming where he first come to die for us, for the sins of the world. The sign, the miracle, the very unusual thing is that the Lord, the glory of the Lord was to be found wrapped in a swaddling clothes to show, of course, his humility. You know in classic Greek, swaddling clothes were normal baby clothes. And the word for swaddling comes from the word to strengthen, right? As when you wrap a baby in tight clothes. So the Messiah then came as a weak baby that needed to be strengthened. Do you see the contrast between the verses here? And the manger shows us how despised he was going to be. Since it is a manger, why was it a manger, by the way? Because there was no room for him in the inn. There was no room for him in Bethlehem. No one had the heart to give their place to a pregnant woman. Much less would they have the heart to let the Messiah live. This is our sign today. This is why the virgin birth. This is why Isaiah 7, 14. So he came to be born a man from the spirit, sinless. He came to die for us. This was, by the way, in opposition to the general expectancies of the time. It was really a sign because the Israelite of the time did not expect the Messiah to come this way. And this we can see it in rabbinical writings of the time. For instance, we read in the Sikta Rabati, which is a collection of homilies, written around this time. It says, when the Messiah appears, they say, God will put on six wonderful garments. One of them, they say, will be clothed in righteousness. They add that the splendor of the garment he puts on, and the Messiah will stream forth from the world's end to the world's end. The swaddling clothes were not, are not there, right? They missed out on the sign of Isaiah 7.14. We also read in Mitrash Rabbah. It says, and this is another collection of rabbinical writing. It says, as for the king, the Messiah, he will clothe him in his own robes. For it says, honor and majesty will thou lay upon him. But what is the honor and the majesty of the Messiah in the swaddling clothes? This is the wonderful sign, sign here, as it links Old Testament prophecy to the first coming of the Messiah. This then is the sign, the incarnation and rejection of the God of the Old Testament. How could God come into the body of a baby? How could he live as a man and as God at the same time? That also is a wonder. That also is a sign. And this sign further speaks of this great dichotomy that God emptied himself somehow, yet without never stopping to be God. This is a miracle. You know, the Greek word for emptied gives us a theological term, kenosis, the doctrine of Christ's self-emptying. While being fully God, he became man in his fullness, except for the sinful part that we have. This really, I want to tell you, is at the core of the Christmas story. It is at the core of the sign the shepherd shops up. How can we ever understand this great sign mystery? How can God be at the same time God and man? You know, I read a, a simple story. Sometimes, you know, simple stories, you know, really bring out the truth. In fact, I read it. I didn't want to use it, but it stayed with me somehow. I want to share it with you. This is a true story. I read about an evangelist who wrote about an event he witnessed in Africa, an event that may help us to see this great sign. He said that in the region he was, water was very scarce, so the people had to dig deep wells. These are not wells as we know them, with brick walls, a pulley and a bucket at the end of the rope. These African people sink a narrow well shaft as much as 100 feet into the ground. Even though the well is deep, the groundwater of that dry land seeps very slowly into it, and there is never a drop to waste. If the water were too easy to reach, the people might not use it sparingly, or an enemy may come at night and take it away. So the tribesmen cut alternating slits into the wall of the well, all the way down to the water. By altering his weight from one leg to the other, a man can use these slits as steps to walk down the shaft to the water. 
Only the largest, strongest men can make the difficult climb down to the well and back up again with a full water skin for the whole tribe. So one day a man carrying the water out of the shaft fell and he broke his leg. He lay at the bottom of the well, no one there to help because no one had the strength to make the climb carrying another man. So the chief was called. When he saw the plight of the injured man, he took off his massive headdress. He also took off his ceremonial robe. Then the chief climbed down into the well, took the weight of the injured man on himself, and brought them in to safety. This, the chief, that is, did what no one else could do. I want to tell you first that this is what Yeshua did for us, right? He came down to rescue us by taking the weight of our sins upon him. He put aside his heavenly robes, just as the chief put aside his headdress and robe, in order to save us. But let me ask you a question. When that chief took off, took off his headdress and robe, did he stop being the chief? Actually, in my opinion, he was more the chief before than before this event. No, of course. In the same way, when Yeshua, when he, he made himself nothing and put aside his heavenly glory, he never ceased being God. In here, we can see the doctrine of the incarnation of Kansas. In there lies the mystery of godliness. This, I want to tell you, is the sign of Isaiah 740. It is the sign to the shepherds. And there's something else about the swaddling clothes. There's a tradition that is related by Arnold Gutenbaum in his Life of Messiah. There he reminds us that these mangers were really kings. And during the winter months, if it were raining, the shepherd brought the flocks into the caves which were used for stables or mangers. But these caves were apparently used for another purpose. If a man died in the town of Bethlehem, his body was taken out of the town in a funeral procession. The first stop was a stable cave where burial clothes were stored. And the body was wrapped in burial clothes. Burial clothes was made of long strips of clothes, and it was often stored in these caves. And it's these clothes that the tradition says Mary used. There seems to have been nothing else available but these clothes. After all, they were not in an inn with a bed and with other, other facilities. So Jesus was wrapped in burial clothes, it seems. On the first day of his life, he was wrapped with the, the same clothes, same type of clothes that he was wrapped on the last day of his life. It's interesting to notice also that the word for swaddling clothes in the Greek is the same that Hippocrates, father of medicine, used for bandages at around 400 BC. And these swaddling clothes are only mentioned by Luke, who himself was a medical <coughs> doctor. He mentions this word three times in verse 7 and 12. It must have meant much more to him. And the idea of a cave manger is believed to have been first brought forth by Justin Martyrs in uh, the year 150 about. He says that Jesus was born in a cave used as an animal coral. This is one in Bethlehem today. You have the basilica called the Church of Nativity, which is built around a cave. In fact, they have a choice between three caves, so they chose one. You don't know which one, right? So the point then of all this information given to us in Luke is that God became man and lived among us so he can now offer salvation. His name is what? Jesus, Yeshua, which means salvation. And as the manger and the swaddling clothes were the sign to the shepherds, it was specially designed for them. And the question we can ask today is, what was the sign to you? Right? What was the sign that brought you to see who Jesus is? We all had our personal sign, our personal tailored call. This is why I love to hear how the Spirit of God came on different people. It is so varied. Sometimes the sign could be the power of the Word of God, as it was in my case. Isaiah 53 just sank into my heart, and that was my sign. For other, it was maybe a powerful white light, a powerful message, a humble life, a loving and forgiving heart, an hour out of the ordinary dream, perhaps. Or maybe you, have, you haven't had your sign yet, right? 
And so why not take this time and ask the Lord now to show you the sign by the way that he personally tailored for you, that he created for you. He has designed a sign just for you. And if you truly seek him, I want to ask them something. There is no doubt that the Lord will come unto you, just like he says in Jeremiah. And if you seek me and find me, when you search me with all your heart, if you really want to know God sincerely from the bottom of your heart, he will reveal himself to you. In fact, he came for this very purpose, so that you might have salvation. But there is one more sign that completes the story of the Incarnation. What is the last sign that Jesus gives to those who reject him? After that, he accused Jesus of working under the devil, which was the last stroke, the sin against the Holy Spirit. It is then that the authorities remember as Jesus for a sign. What did Jesus answer them? Luke 11, 29. This is an evil ge generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except what? The sign of Jonah, the prophet. The sign of Jonah is the resurrection of the Messiah. Something that no enemy of Jesus believes or expects at all. They believe him to be dead. But he is alive and coming back. If the first sign of his humble birth is not believed, he will surprise them as a thief in the night. When he comes back alive and resurrected as his second coming as the judge. Very often we seek our own sign and we miss the real one. We seek only a sign we expect, a sign we have tailored ourselves for ourselves. But God may have something else for us that we often do not expect. This is why it is called a sign. It's a miracle. When dealing with God, I want to tell you something. We should always expect the unusual. We should always expect a miracle. And this sign of Jonah is precisely the sign that Shimeon spoke about in Luke 2.34. You can go there see what it says. It says, Then Shimeon blessed, blessed them, that is, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child, that is Jesus, is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. The word for sign is the same word. What did he mean by that? He meant that the sign that was given to bring people to a saving knowledge may be turned against the Messiah himself, exactly what they did in Luke 11. The swaddling clothes were trampled on, and the majority, in fact, as Shimeon says, will speak evil of the Messiah. There are then two signs. The one of Isaiah 7.14, which speaks of his humiliation for our salvation, and the other is the sign of Jonah, which speaks of Jesus coming on a white horse at the end. See now that after the revelation of the Shekinah glory to the shepherd, we read in verse 20, it says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. They became evangelists. They went everywhere to tell the people of the birth of the Messiah, no wonder that they are despised in rabbinical writings. But how can you stop someone who touched the Lord? How can you stop someone who had a revelation of the Lord? You know, when you touch what is true, when you touch what is holy, the rest becomes unimportant. The opposition becomes more of a nuisance than the monstrous forces they want to project. Jesus said it in John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is what Jesus offers. He offers us freedom. He offers us freedom for sin. He offers us, he's offering us things where we can use our free will. And it was Tony Evans who compared our freedom to that of the hamsters. He said that people live their lives like hamsters. You know, a hamster looks outside the glass of his cage and he sees freedom. So he decides to run for it. He gets in the wheel, he, he runs on the wheel, trying to get to his freedom. He soon realizes that he's not getting anywhere. So he runs faster and an hour later he's the same spot. You know, many of us are trying to get somewhere but we cannot, we often 
do not see God's signs for our lives. We've made new New Year's resolution. We're going to make the new ones as well. You know, we're going to make resolution perhaps to quit bad habits and to have better marriages or to work on bettering our finances. A year later, we are in the same position. Why? Why does this happen? We are using the wrong methods. When we are trapped, we cannot change things ourselves. The only way for a hamster to find freedom is for the owner of the hamster to reach inside the cage and to lift it out there. Somebody bigger than the hamster has to take over. This is the lesson here. Trying to get out of the cage situation using only our own human effort is not good enough. We need to realize that we have a great source of power in God. It says in John 1, 12, that the one who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ become what? He has the power to, to be a child of God. This is power. We have this power. Let's use it in our prayer, in our Bibles, and so on. Let's look at the next section of chapter Luke. It shows us how obedient, by the way, to the Mosaic law, the parents of Jesus were. Let's read verses 21 to 24. It says, when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was con conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what he said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. <coughs> here we have mentioned here uh, three ordinances from the Mosaic law. In verse 21, we have the law of circumcision. In verse 22, we have the law of purification. And in verse 23, we have the law of the firstborn. And there's going to be many, many references to the Mosaic Law as we go deeper into the Gospel of Luke. And since this is our first encounter with the law here, there is one thing that is paramount, that is crucial in understanding the Gospel. That is that Jesus was under the law until the end of his life here on earth. Many things he said and did were done because he was under the law. And if he was under the law, it's not because we are called to be under the law, as many concluded. The very reason he was under the law is so that we will not be under the law. Not that the law is bad. The reason of the law is because we're bad. The law is good. It is the word of God. It was designed so that we can realize the sins that is in us and run to the Messiah who fulfilled the law for us so that we may not fall under its condemnation. There's nothing complicated, is there? You know, I get, sometimes I get amazed, sometimes I still cannot understand about those who say that we should, that part of the law is obligatory, it's mandatory. Of course, no one can say that the whole law is obligatory. They know that there's no temple and it's impossible to say this, so they say that some part of the Mosaic law is still obligatory and they are so convinced of it. And, the, and so they teach others. First, I want to tell you, these completely disregard the law of the Messiah that brings out the spirit of the Messiah. What is the law of the Messiah? This is the law that we find in the letters that we have in the New Testament. Did you know it is the exact same law? It is the exact same law without the condemnation. All the moral aspect of the law is there. And when you take, as if you take an orange and you peel it, it is there when you can enjoy it. And second, this completely disregard these clear verses that say that you cannot take what you want from the law. It's a whole. You can't just take one and say, oh, today it exists, the others not. Remember these passages. James 2.10, Deuteronomy 27.26. He says, For soever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of it all. Assume that a ship is anchored at port with an anchor that has 613 links in its chain, representing the 613 commands in the Mosaic Law. If one link breaks, would the ship fault? Do you think it falls? 
if one ship, one, one leaf breaks, the season and 13 others cannot hold the ship together. Or consider your situation if you had fallen over an edge or a very high cliff and were clinging to a chain for life. How many links of that chain must break before you would fall to your death? Only one. Only one. This is the point of Moses. This is James' point as well. So Jesus was under the law and he came to save us from the condition of the law, not to bring us back in the law. So this is important to know as we're now encountering the Mosaic law. And personally, one of my favorite studies, by the way, is the law. Especially when we study the book of Deuteronomy which brought us to see the beauty of God's law and its severe condemnation, which helped us to see the grace of God in sending His Son. I want to tell you that what history teaches us about the Mosaic Law is that those who want to follow it without accepting its purpose and message will end up like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They worked so hard to implement the law in their lives that they completely forgot the Messiah. When He came, they couldn't recognize Him at all. You know, I like an illustration that uh, Schofield uses. He lived in London at that time. It appears that there were many gods in the city. He said in one sermon that there were three sorts of gods in his city of London. First, the wild, masterless gods that roam the streets at will. Second, the chain of dogs, which could not be trusted for more than a few feet. And third, the dog that knew and loved his master and responded obediently to his voice. The first of these had liberty, but no law. The second had law, but no liberty. Whereas the last enjoyed the perfect law of liberty, which is the law is called by the word the Messiah here. The truth is that all men seem to be like one of these three gods. The masses are utterly lawless when it comes to the authority of God. They are dominated by sin, and sin is lawlessness. And then there are many who are like the dog on the leash. They have a law, but they have no liberty at all. These are the legalists and the religious in the religious realm. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and our local righteousness. Religiousness, that is. These being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. But the believer who knows the truth of the New Testament, he needs no change but he's guided by his master's eyes and his master's voice. So let's go back to the text. So the first law mentioned is that of the circumcision. Just like that of John the Baptist, Jesus' parents were under the Mosaic law and they fulfilled the commandment of the circumcision. The second law was that of childbirth purification, which according to Leviticus 12, the mother was unclean for seven days after the birth. And if she gave birth to a son, she remained unclean for a total of 40 days. So Joseph and Mary needed to stay in the region of Bethlehem and Jerusalem for 40 days after the birth, so to fulfill the requirement of the law. Of course, they were poor. We will see that they were poor by the sacrifices they gave. Probably the shepherds provided for them. The third is very interesting. It is the offering of the firstborn. The idea here is that God required the parents to offer the best of what they had. Their firstborn, in the same way, by the way, that he offered the best of what he had, his firstborn. This ceremony is a great illustration of two parties who deeply love each other and give each other the best they have. Behind this is the memory of the death of the firstborn in Egypt, in Exodus 12. In the next, it is in the next chapter, in Exodus 13, that God asked the Israelites to offer their firstborn. So it reminds the Israelite of their deliverance from Egypt. It reminds them of the blood of the Lamb. Today this tradition is called Bidin Aden, or for the redemption of the firstborn. And it is, by the way, still respected. How it happens is that the father presents his son, his firstborn, often in a, on a silver tray decorated with jewelry, to a Levite who represents the priesthood. I remember doing this with my firstborn. After being officially presented with a child, the Levite asks the father whether he prefers to redeem his son or to leave it to him. So the father, the father selects the former alternative and gives the Levite five silver coins. Apparently, they have to be five silver coins. And I've, 
I've heard that uh, the Bank of Israel, in conjunction with the Israeli government, has minted special redemption coins so they can use it for this purpose. And in the Old Testament, the firstborn of a family was the most treasured possession of the parents. Parents who have a child know this, that the firstborn was to receive, in fact, a double inheritance. He was to receive the great blessings from the father. This is why Jacob pretended to be the firstborn to Isaac, as we are told in Genesis 27. He says, I'm Esau, you firstborn. He wanted the blessing attached to the firstborn, knowing that it was given already by God. Firstborn were important to the father. This is why also in Genesis 48, Joseph was displeased with his father Jacob when he gave the blessing to the younger Ephraim instead of the firstborn Manasseh. And now God says to the Israelite, and he asks us as well, I want you to give me your dearest possession. He wants us to give us, to give him our best, because he gave us his best. That is the point, by the way, of this beautiful ceremony. God requires nothing short of our best, the essential things of our lives. And what about us today? What is the most important things, thing in your life that you're keeping away from God? What is most important? You know, there are many things around us that are begging our attention. They are begging to be our best. Life is filled with a multitude of calls, a multitude of voices to which one responds. Our best cannot be the acquisition of wealth. For those who acquired wealth, declare to us that at the end is futile. Remember King Solomon, the riches of it all. Vanity, he says. It cannot be also the attainment of fame. Many famous people went bankrupt, not financially, but spiritually. All these things will bring us nowhere but bring us down. I don't know if you heard of the story of Larry Walters, 33-year-old man, who decided he wanted to impress his neighbors. You know what he did? He did a really silly thing. He, he went down to the local army surplus, surplus store, and he brought 45 used water balloons. No, weather balloons. <laughs> okay, that afternoon he, he strapped himself into a long chair to which several of his friends tied, were with him and they put helium into the balloons. You know, he took along with him six pack of beers and peanut butters and jelly sandwiches and a BB gun, figuring that he could shoot a balloon at one time and just go down when he, was, he wants. So Walter, who assumed the balloons would lift him up only a hundred feet in the air, right? was caught off guard when the chair soared 11,000 feet in the sky, where the plane actually flew, actually, smack into the middle, middle of the air traffic patterns of Los Angeles International Airport. And too frightened to shoot any of the balloons, and perhaps also too frozen, he stayed airborne for more than two hours, forcing the airport actually to close down for a whole afternoon, you know. So when we give preeminence to false priorities, we often end up like Walter, completely disappointed to say the least, actually. And let me tell you that the most important thing in life for you, according to the Word of God, is to fulfill in your heart and life the plan and purpose that God has for you. How do you know the God and purpose of God? Of His purpose, that is, you go into the Word of God. You follow his precepts. You discipline yourself to hear, to pray, and to do the things. I have found again that lack of discipline is that one thing that many believers actually don't have or have. You know, fulfillment is found in searching God and knowing him so that we can walk with him. This is where our happiness lies. So whatever we do, if we do not include God in our plans, it may be that at the end, we will be very, very disappointed. But with God, you will never be disappointed. I will conclude again with the last, last story here. So a rich man once asked his friend, Why am I criticized for being miserly? He said, Everyone knows I will leave everything to charity when I die. Well, said the friend, let me tell you about the pig who was lamenting to the cow one day about how unpopular he was. People are always talking about your gentleness and your kind eyes, says the pig. Sure, you give milk and cream, but I give more. 
I gave bacon, I gave ham, bristle, everything that I have. They even pick on my feet. Still nobody likes me. Why is this? So the cow thought for a minute and replied. He says, well, maybe it's because I give while I'm still living. I give while I am still living. Right? That's where I had a prayer. Well, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the book of Luke and all these riches that we have there. Lord, we ask that you bless each and every one here, each and every person, Lord, you know their heart. You know those, Lord, that desire to serve you and perhaps they are torn apart by the things in this life. I pray, Lord, that you will show them your will. They will show them another sign, another sign that they might follow. And Lord, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, Lord, you have favored that sign for them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will show them so that they will come and say, yes, Jesus is my Savior. Yes, I am a sinner. And so his name will be written down in the book of life. Thank you again for your word as we bring Yeshua's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.